These are the most foundational roles, fatherhood. These are the roles, motherhood, that uh, make the nation great. God uses, out from Adam and Eve, came nations. And so, out from you will come dynasties, mighty men of God, women of God. Be the strong link in your generational chain. Remember that there were forebears before you, right back to Adam. Some were weak, some were strong. But you have a privilege, you have an opportunity in being the best father in your whole generational chain. Maybe better than your own father. And may your children rise up and be better fathers than you. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing for the world? And so, it's a generational, God is generational in his mindset, in his thinking, and he wants us to be generational too. Not just to be taken up with our present fatherhood, our present day, but taken up with, our, with the future of our children. So imparting godly examples to our family is all about fatherhood. All right, so we're going to get back into where we were, the 21 points on how to make your wife happy and contented in the home. She'll love you for it. She will. And she will love you that you are big enough and teachable enough to learn these things so that she will be blessed. Remember, she is, though the scripture calls her the weaker vessel, and I think that's talking about physically, she's weaker. But ne not necessarily character-wise she's weaker, or spiritually she's weaker. That is not the case. She's weaker physically, usually, than men. I might say this too while I'm talking on this. I think uh, women really appreciate masculine men. And, uh, and I think men appreciate feminine women, right? Not women that are trying to be men. Much of this uh, mindset out there in the world is trying to mix the sexes up so there's no, and mix the roles up so that um, men are forced into the home and women are forced out into the workplace. Um, or at least trying to put women into the military and, uh, and leading the nations of the world um, because they just, you know, a lot of these women actually because of their roles that they've had, their parental roles that have been over them have caused them to despise men. And, uh, and the feminists largely are those that have had fathers that have not been good fathers or had no fathers at all. And so we are the ones that are rising up to show the world what fatherhood's all about. To resurrect fatherhood, restore it to the glory that God intended it to have. Not to turn our wives into chattels like the Islamics do. But obviously Jesus have honoured women. And we are those that should honour them as well. Alright, so we're looking at, um, we've, we've passed on from lecturing your wife. And I find myself lecturing her from time to time. And I know she doesn't approve it. She doesn't like to be lectured to. And remember this, men, your wife doesn't like to be lectured at. And you don't like to be lectured at from her. Right? So we need to cut down the lecturing instead of that showing encouragement and sympathy. She really, we need, we need encouragement. We men need encouragement. We want encouraging wives. We love them for their encouragement to us, but they need that also from us. It's a, such a blessing for them. So above rubies, really, the retreats that we have, they're simply called above rubies because my wife started the ministry for encouraging mothers and families. And of course, as it, got, as it went along, developed, many women would come from the retreats that my wife was running, and they would say, well, we were so touched with Nancy's ministry. They come out of the, out of, honestly, the Spirit of God was so moving on the subject of motherhood that they'd come out from the, the lectures literally crying, crying with tears flowing from their faces. And they'd say, our hearts have been so touched. These are truths that have been robbed, we've been robbed of. We've been told that if, we, uh, if we're in the home, if we're in the home and we're making... Men, uh, we, we are raising children that we are vegetables. We're not thinking. We're uh, peasants. We're, we're those that lack, that lack um, 
you know, the fortitude or whatever it is to, to, to raise yourself out of the home, you're going to be dominated in the home and you're going to be suffering from some kind of a mind disease called suburban neurosis. And so get out of the home, free yourself from the home, get out, lay bricks on the street or anything to be free from the home. So we walk down the streets and we see work crews with women laying bricks or something like that. Yes, I've seen it. And I don't think that's freedom at all. That's not liberty. My wife, I remember this when she was starting this ministry in New Zealand. She got caught on, on uh, they, they captured her on the camera. And she's standing out in a, in a big family convention. That was the first one that was held in New Zealand. It was They invited Nancy to come and speak on motherhood. And she was sharing there, and the cameras caught her, and I saw it. And here's this big, tall, red-headed lady saying to a world that was kind of rejecting parenting, rejecting motherhood, and she was saying, I am free, I am free, I am free to be a wife, I am free to be a mother, I am free to be at home. And it really rocked the nation. It was amazing. And then they came out from these meetings and they'd be crying and they'd come up to my car or I'd be waiting for my wife to take her home and they'd say, Mr. Campbell, um, you know, our hearts have been so touched but who's going to speak to our husbands? We can't. Of course, you don't want to be lectured by your wife, right? <laughs> we don't want that. They said, will you speak to them? And so gradually, I think over time, because it was a, a sort of a thing that I had never been taught about, I went to a Christian bookshop looking for some form of literature. In those days, when I was just a young father, there was nothing in the Christian bookshops on fatherhood. You couldn't buy a single book on the subject anywhere. Not even the secular lib libraries had anything. I searched them. I was looking. There was nothing on the internet. There was nothing for fatherhood. And so here I am. I thought there's only one book that I know where it does mention fatherhood and that's in this book. And so I, I went through every reference in the Bible to fatherhood and I, and I raised up a, a session on, on biblical fathering from this book. And I found out that Jesus spoke more about fatherhood than any other writer in the whole Bible. So isn't that a wonderful thing? So. And they said, who's going to talk about fatherhood? Who will tell our husbands? And I found that the Lord has taken this, this guy, weak that I am, and used me in this particular way. So it's an honor to me to be here to share the, the wonderful truths that God has given me. So Nancy and I as a team can go, and can go here and there all over the place. And uh, I think... It's only just begun. There's so much work to be done, but you are joining me in a pioneering movement of raising fatherhood again and motherhood and so on like that throughout the world. You are to take these words and share them with your friends and your neighbors and influence the church that you're in. Don't be ashamed. Speak up. Today's the moment for speaking up. Absolutely it is. We need to stand up and share the truths. Let your church know these truths. Somehow, even if you can, if you can't run meetings in your church for the men or get possible opportunities to share in men's, men's meetings and you couldn't get Colin Campbell to come all the way from the US or whatever, at least take them home to your home, <coughs> give them a meal after a Sunday service and share with them some of these truths. But get the message out. It's not just for you. It's for all of Christendom. Men, we have to, it has to get to the masses. It has to get to the, to the people outside our small group. And, and, and it's going to be you. And I think Jesus saw that when he trained those 12 disciples, that he could see that it would be multiplied out through them. So, you're a fellow pioneer with me. Would you join me in pioneering fatherhood throughout, throughout this world? All right. Be a brighter and happier man in her presence. Everybody say that, please. Be a brighter and happier man in her presence. Your wife does not need a sober side. 
Your, not, your wife does not need a man that's too serious, over, overly serious. Now, in myself, I'm a quieter man, though you might not think that that's the case. You've got no idea how timid I was in growing up. But I think when the Holy Spirit got hold of me, he did a dynamic work in turning me into, a, to be able to speak and to be able to preach. And I was not naturally this way at all. I'm telling you this, it just wasn't natural. I had brothers. I had a brother that was 13 months younger than me that had such a gift of the gab. He, he could speak it on any subject, just bang like that and away you'd go and crowds would listen to him and he was really good. But I was not that way. I, but the Lord took hold of me and raised me up. And I pray for him because he's hardly being used with all the gift of the gab naturally that he has. But the Lord has taken me up despite my, my own insignificance. And the, like, the Lord likes to take the weak things of the world. Don't think you can do it. You can't do it. You can do it. Just speak up. You can talk about football. Where's our IT man here? Where is he? Somewhere? I don't know. Where? There. Yeah. People can talk about football. They can talk about their cars. They can talk about all the things that men are interested in. But when it comes to these things, they kind of are shy and timid and <laughs> feel they can't talk. Let this subject get into your heart, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So it has to, this subject has to come into your affections. That's why it's talking about the Elijah anointing, uh, for he shall, in Malachi chapter 4, toward the end of the chapter, it talks about, and he shall turn the hearts of the father, the hearts of the fathers to the children. It's not just a matter of having this stuff in our minds, or having the knowledge of it, it's really got to get into our hearts and really take hold of our affections so that we are affectionate fathers. And while I'm, on, while I'm talking about that, Jesus, where did he come from when he spoke about his father? You know where he came from? He said, he that is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. Jesus said, you can talk about my father, the prophets can talk about my father, Moses could talk about my father, but I come from his affections. This is my beloved son. I come from his heart, I come from his feelings, I come from his emotions. And that's where all our sons should come from and our daughters too. Isn't that true? And so let it get into your heart. Let this word get into your heart and you'll have no trouble speaking about it. Whatever the subject of whatever you're taking up in life, you would probably, my dear brother John here, he, he, he likes various things and he has just been sharing to me out of the abundance of his heart, he's been sharing to me some natural things and I've been enjoying it. No problem, John. No problem whatsoever. He's just full of it. He's just going for it. Well, you know, in this subject of fatherhood and parenting, let it get into your heart. So it takes your affections and you'll have no difficulty pouring it out to others. Amen to that? Right. Here we go. So be brighter. Remember that throughout the day, your wife has to cope with crying children, doing all that she can in the home to keep the peace. I've met women at the end of the day when you come home and your wife is just about pulling her hair out. She's to totally frustrated. She's had a hard day. The children have been kind of cross. There may have been colds. And even when we're staying around Europe, we're staying around these different countries, you know, we're staying with families and there's children that are vomiting up and the local flu that's going around, you know, and they're crying, crying, crying and all that kind of thing. Your wife has to put up with that sort of thing all day long, <laughs> right? So she needs you to be a bright spot. All right, here we go. <clears throat> It certainly doesn't help her, second line, it certainly doesn't help her when she also has to cope with a griping, grisly, over-serious man. Let's all say that. It certainly, come on, it certainly doesn't help her when she has to cope with a griping, grisly, over-serious man who doesn't know how to look on the bright side of life. That's right. <laughs> What your wife needs more than a serious man, though there's nothing wrong with being serious, but we have to watch that we're not overly serious, she needs a man that will smile and smile at her 
smile at the children, a smiling man. It's like a breath of fresh air to her. You know how the home can get tense, tensions. So when, she, when you come home, brighten up her life. She's had it. She's had all sorts of stress and immaturity throughout the day. But when you come home, say, hi, everybody. It's great to be home. It's great. Don't talk about all your failures and all the faults that you've been going through. She doesn't need all that. She needs, she needs you to just brighten up her day. All right? You want to keep your wife in your home. You want her to be a happy mother. You want her to be a contented mother. This will help her. It will. Isn't it important for her to be contented? Isn't it, isn't it right <coughs> for her to be, to, be, uh, <coughs> to be brightened up? Well, you're going to be the one. You're responsible. You're a husband. You're responsible to get into that home, come home to that home, put down your kind of a glum look. Some people say, well, it's just our heritage. We're always glum. This is the way our culture is, to portray us men as kind of a sober sides. I remember this. I remember seeing one of these most famous pictures in America, right, of this old couple, obviously very religious, standing outside their barn. I don't know what that picture was called, but we have it at home. You can look it up on the computer. It's a very, very famous picture. Have you ever seen it? This old couple, right, standing out. She's got a pitchfork. He's got pitchforks in his hands. He's got a pitchfork. And they're so glum. And they're so sober. If this was to be the representation of Christianity, if this was to be the people that the world would love to see, I don't see the likeness and image of God in that picture at all. All I see is just strict, religious, serious, over-serious people. Somehow or other, Christianity has given a false impression of God. I know that God can be serious on certain areas. He certainly can. But I don't think that God, our God is a serious, sober side. I think that he also has tolerance and patience and sympathy and joy. I think when we get to heaven, we'll find heaven is a very joyous place. Amen? Do you, think, do you want to go to heaven? Who would want to go to heaven if it was just going to be a serious place? For it's a house of joy. It's a place of peace. And God wants our homes to represent that home. Amen? He wants you and I to be like God the Father and bring some smiles and bring some brightness into the home. It's possible because Christ is living in you. The Christ of peace for the kingdom of heaven is not just about meat and drink, but it's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, now, no matter how serious things may be, no matter how bad it may be, that everything's gone wrong. With Christ in the vessel, you can smile at the storm. Smile at the storm, smile at the storm. Yes. Cast off that shell of, I don't know, seriousness. And learn to smile more. Everybody say, learn to smile more. Learn to smile more. Yes. You might say, well, that sounds very kind of shallow stuff. But I think the Holy Spirit within us smiles more when it comes to our family life, dealing with the problems that we have. He knows that there's an answer. There is a way through. He has a victory for us, and so he wants us to be more happier around our wives rather than super cybersides. All right. Men have mentioned to me that being a, in a place of responsibility at work, it is much easier. I had a man in a retreat, retreat recently stand up and say this. He said, I find at work, he said, I am a, I'm over a whole bunch of men. And he said, I find, find, have no difficulty in getting that office to run smoothly. He said, that is my gift. I have organizational skills. He said, if there's chaos, I can sort it out. He said, if there's resistance and rebellion, he said, I can dismiss them. 
He said, but when I go home, there's chaos and I don't know what to do. <laughs> he said, why can't I have a home like my office, like my work? And I said this. I said, you are dealing with immaturity. You can't just dismiss your children. You can't just say you're rebellious. Brett, you're out of this home. Gone. You can't say that to your wife. You have to learn how to deal with immaturity. And remembering that we are also immature in many, many ways. Don't jump at it too fast. Don't go like a bull at a gate. A bull at a gate. Do you say that, have that saying over here? Don't be a bull at a gate. A bull at a gate. A bull's a very nasty creature, actually. Some of them, some of them can be, especially those Jersey bulls. My, had, my father had a 640-acre farm in New Zealand. We had cows and we had bulls. We had one bull that was the most treacherous bull that you could ever, <laughs> you ever clap eyes on. He was a Jersey bull. He looked a massive and a fantastic specimen. But we boys had teased him so bad growing up. We had teased the living daylights out of that bull. So any time you went into the field, he'd want to charge everything that came in. If a tractor went in the field, he'd charge it. If a, if a horse went in there with you on it, he'd charge it. <laughs> he was just really ropeable. <laughs> he'd be way down to the bottom of this valley. We kept him in a valley. They had a big acreage there, and he'd be way down in the bottom of the valley, and we boys would stand up on the top and tease him because we knew he'd walk all the way to the top furious. And so we would start saying, at the top. And before long, you'd see him pouring the ground, pouring the ground and re reacting to it. Up he'd come, and when he'd get to the top, he'd be fit to kill. I mean, he was a treacherous bull. I can tell you more about that story, but I won't. But don't be like a bull at a gate and just jump in and try and sort the problem out too quick. Just hold yourself with patience and react, react more um, carefully. Like they often say, a bull in a china shop. Have you heard that one? Bull in a china shop. Well, what is it? Talking about a shop in China? No, it's talking about crockery, right? Crockery, like delicate cups and saucers and all that kind of stuff. This precious stuff, well, don't put, uh, I would hate to see that china shop of that bull got in there. I mean, he had wrecked it <laughs> no time flat. But men are like that. They don't recognize their wife has tender feelings. She's sensitive. She can be hurt so easily. Everybody say, she can be hurt so easily. Come on. She can be hurt so easily. She is like the china. She's like the delicate vessels. She's like the cups and the saucers and the plates that are, that are expensive. What do you call it over here? I mean, England has made Dalton, is it Dalton? Yeah. Dalton, China, the most valuable, precious stuff. Oh, my, it's been handed down from family to family, a whole set of beautiful Dalton um, crockery, plates and saucers and everything. And when my dad died, it was like my mother had it in her china cabinet. And then it was given to me. There's one cup broken. However, it's a precious, precious possession. And I take care of it. I've got it at home. It'll be handed on to my children. It'll probably go from generation to generation. But remember this, guys. Your wife has precious feelings, don't, don't, she's, like, she's like that delicate stuff. You can, she can be hurt so easily. She's more hurtable than a man is, to be honest. She's more of an emotional creature than men. And so she can be trodden on, damaged and hurt so easily. Don't be a bull in the china shop of your home. <laughs> That's what the Holy Ghost is saying today. Yes, Res respect her feelings. God made her this way. She is what she is. She can't help it. God put that, made her sensitive. So realize that. Why do I say these things? Because you and her are bringing into the world the likeness and image of God with our children. All right. But we're dealing with immaturity that's going to take time. Your, child, your children, the boys that are here this morning, they may be mature for their age. Very mature. 
They may be beyond their normal children of their age. The same with us. But if they re maintain the present maturity and when they're 40 or 50 years or 30 years or 20 years down the track, there's something wrong. The same thing with you and I. But we're raising maturity in our homes. And so we have to be patient. This man said, I, I, can't, I can't do it. He said, what do I have to do? Well, I have to realize you've got to have patience with your family, right? And just work your way through those things. Learn to loosen up. Everybody say that, please. Learn to loosen up. Smile more, come on, smile more. Laugh more with your wife and your children. Do not allow imperfections of your family to turn you into a sober side. All right, number seven. Compliment her liberally. Everybody say with me, please. Let's just say it together this, because this is the, um, the emphasis of the next point. Come on, compliment her liberally. 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 I mean, just like this man that was at our house, he'd never complimented his wife personally. We have this Jewish Shabbat meal. We, we're not Jews, but we op operate the Shabbat meal because it, in that Shabbat meal, you have to compliment your wife. So my wife decided we should have a Jewish Shabbat, Shabbat meal, which says that she'd get some compliments from me. <laughs> She likes them. So I have to think of something different every Friday night. And I'll tell you what, you'll think twice about having an argument with your wife when you've got Friday night coming up and you're going to have to compliment her. <laughs> yes. And so at that table, we go around the table and, and the husband, the father, compliments his wife and he says, Darling, I see, I've noticed something about you this week. And something about, and I just want to compliment John. I noticed that you did a great thing in such and such. And I noticed that, and, and by the way, I love that beautiful, those beautiful clothes you've got on. And by the way, you don't appear to me to be getting older. <laughs> compliment her on all sorts of things. In front of the children. Everybody say in front of the children. In front of the children. You know what? They like that. They like to hear their father complimenting their wife. It brings security into them. They love it. As somebody said, the greatest thing you can give, give your children is to love their mother. If you don't love your wife, that's depriving your children if you don't love their mother. So love her, compliment her. Then she will in turn on the Shabbat meal, she'll compliment you back. But we had this couple, we had this couple at our home. He never said a single word ever to his wife. In fact, the only way he talked to his wife was through the children. He would talk to the children. I asked him when they were going and he said, I have to ask my children to ask my wife. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, he was dying. He was dying with cancer. Serious. I mean, this gr growth around here was just huge. And uh, we got them over for a Shabbat meal before he died. He had she had never, he had never said a negative word again about her to anybody else. He never did that. I'd never, he'd always praised her to other people, but he never praised her. What a tragedy. And so around that table that night, I, I shared to my wife and shared about some wonderful things and she appreciated it and I told her I loved her and gave her a kiss in front of the children. And she did something like that back to me. Told me how she loved me for whatever. And then I said to this guy, James, I said, James, time for you. Well, he stood up. He didn't stand up. He just pulled himself up in his chair. He had this huge, massive growth. He didn't have long to live. And he started with his wife. And you could have cut the air with a knife, in a good sense. They were listening like sponges. They had been deprived all their lives. The girls were there, several of the beautiful girls were there. They had been deprived. The wife had been deprived. And here she is. 
almost on her husband's deathbed, around our dinner table, him telling them how beautiful they were and the good points that he had observed in their lives. And it was like, where have you been? Give us more. <coughs> they were like thirsty plants that were dying out there until somebody comes along in mercy and puts some water down upon them. That's the way they were, like sponges. And so, let's be liberal with uh, these things to, towards us. Don't brush aside their weaknesses. We're not allowed to talk about weaknesses. We do not talk about weaknesses on a Friday night when we're, when we're doing this. We, we do not bring up a weakness. Wouldn't it be a tragedy if you had us, they, they put out the, the candles, they dress up the table, put on out their best clothes, make it something special, and then at the time when you are meant to be eulogizing her, you destroy her <laughs> with saying something really negative. That would be terrible. That would, that would really affect them negatively. And so, what's it say here? Proverbs 18, 21. Death, come on, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So you have a chance to use your tongue to minister life or you can minister death. Minister life. Choose life. Most wives are starving for the lack of a complimenting husband. I, re I reiterate that. Most wives are starving for the lack of a complimenting husband. He compliments other women, but he doesn't compliment his wife. He compliments other people, but he doesn't compliment his wife. So. But we should not only do it, but not sort of drag the chain on it. We should do it with a willing heart and, and, and freely. They say, well, if I did it freely, it would kind of um, make it ch cheap or it would kind of uh, maybe spoil her. Well, spoil her for once or twice. <laughs> Amen. She is, your, she is your love mate. Right. Most wives are starving for the lack of a complimenting husband. Not only should we compliment our wife, but we should do it liberally. Tough economic times can put a lot of stress, um, strain on a marriage. We may have to cut back on certain things. But one thing we men must never cut back on, and that's a complimenting tongue. Right? It will be easier for your wife to be a stay-at-home mother if she has a husband who compliments her about her appearance, Everybody say appearance. appearance. How she orders her home. Come on. How she orders her home. How she cares for the family. How she cares for the family. A woman likes to be complimented on her looks. Yes, yeah, she does. Men, she does. A woman loves a husband that will compliment on her looks. She may not want the rest of the world to know, but she wants to know that you would compliment her on her looks. Amen? It's good. I, I tell my wife, and she's, she's over 70, but I say to her, darling, I chose you because, not because I had a red car with a convertible rollback roof. I chose you because... That's what I had when I met my wife. And she went for it. <laughs> she I did. <laughs> uh, you know, she ca I said, you know, I know what won you, darling. She doesn't like me saying it. I said it was my red convertible. I only mean, just teasing her, of course. But no, I say to her, she, you look tall. I always want a tall woman. Now, not everybody does, but I did. I think there are plenty of plenty beautiful little ones too, small women, <laughs> plenty of them. But I always wanted as a boy growing up, I want a tall woman with a nice figure. That's what I wanted. I don't know about you, but that's what I wanted. And I still tell her that she still looks like that. Yes, I do. And of course, all the girls, we have girls coming in from around the country. They all kind of laugh their heads off when I say that. But I say, look, I'm just a man. I'm a man. I'm a man. I'm not ashamed to be a man. I'm a red, hot-blooded man. And I like my wife because she keeps her figure good. I don't mind. She, she, she eats a special diet and she 
wants the special food and she's trying to keep herself right. She's doing it for me. She just needs me to say, darling, I appreciate it. Thank you. Do more of it. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, it'll be much easier for your wife to be a stay-at-home mother if she has a husband who compliments her about her appearance, how she orders the home, how she cares for the family. A woman likes to be complimented on her looks, her figure, her style, her dress, her attitude, her personality, her talents, her gifts, plus 101 other little things. There are many things that you will find that maybe nobody else would see, but you know her and you need to compliment her on it. Yes. She's a treasure trove. Compliment her. She will love you for it. And she'll serve you. She'll do anything for you. She'll do anything for you. If you'll just compliment her. Well. Okay. Do not be too busy to take time to compliment your wife every day. Right. Number eight. Willingly discuss with her any difficulties. Let's all say this together, shall we? Willingly discuss with her any difficulties. Come on. She faces with the children or any problems she may want to talk with you about regarding any matter at all. Okay, we've covered a little bit of this, but we'll just go over it quickly. Always be prepared to offer words of encouragement and wisdom. Always be ready to pray with her. Let's all say that's a good point. That's a good point. Always be ready to pray with her. Because many times she will need God to come through. Many times you will need God to come through. So we're a team where two of you are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. That's a family. That's a husband and wife. If, if two of you shall agree as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them. It's the prayer of agreement. What more powerful agreement could we have than to have a husband and wife together in unity in prayer? How could we expect God to work in our lives when we have no unity with our wives? How can he, he says, uh, what's it say? To, to, to do the right thing with your wife so that your prayers will not be hindered. I think prayers are hindered and many powerful you know, needs that we have in our family life and so on like that are not met because we do not know how to pray in unity. So if we're doing these kind of things, your wife will, will be in unity with you. She won't be saying, well, you're praying, you big hypocrite. Why don't you show me a little bit more love? Don't just go home and say, well, okay, wife, the pastor said we should start praying. That would just kill her. You know, she, she needs somebody that, that will kind of uh, show love and respect and do... And, and create an atmosphere and then say to her, darling, we need to pray about this. Spend some time in, in, in getting unity going, getting the flow going, and then when you've got all that loving spirit happening between you and her, say, look, let's pray. Can you say amen? And then God loves that spirit of unity. Now, let me just give you a little classical example. This is not husband and wives, but how God loves unity. We had African children we, we, we adopted from Africa. They, they really rebelled against us because they were teenagers, they came from an orphanage. And they were like, it wouldn't matter whether they're white or whether they're red or yellow or black, it wouldn't have made any difference. They were already stacked up, stacked up against leadership before they came into our home. So we went through all sorts of great, great, great difficulties. And, and my daughter Serene also invited, she adopted six. Some old, some young. No problems with the young ones. The older ones, yes, major problems. But let me tell you the story. We, we, we started to get unity. They were coming back. They'd already fled. Some of them had fled. They're coming back home, apologizing, saying after maybe six months, 12 months, or whatever else, ran off, came back, Now they're learning that America's not just some, some kind of a place where they're going to have servants. 
where they're going to live in mansions, where they, everything's just going to be rolled out for the red carpet, rolled out for them, and there's no responsibility, they don't have to take any responsibility. Now they're learning for themselves, they've had to go out into that world and, 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 and earn a job and get a job and plead for a job and, and somehow face responsibilities and now all of a sudden wisdom's starting to come back into them and they're calling us up and saying, we are so sorry. We are so sorry. Mummy and Daddy, will you please forgive us? And of course we'd go, like the prodigal son coming home, we'd go running to them. Of course, amen, we will forgive you. Well, some of our own family, biological children, took resentment to that. When we started to, we started to forgive them, they didn't feel that they could because we were their biological parents and we had been abused and we had been kind of walked on. And they thought, well, what are you doing? Forgiving them? And so we, we had it pretty tough for a while. We kind of like had to stand in this. I, I'd say to them, look, God forgives us. Why shouldn't we forgive these children? So anyway, um, my, my daughter Serene, she was going through such a problem with this. And her husband too. And uh, with one of them that had run off from them. You know, and, and it was more difficult for them because they had little children that could be marched off. That could be taken away by the child protection services and they're doing that all over the world. They're doing it all over America. Unbelievable. Uh, an organization that's under the government that has unlimited power. Run by feminist type women, usually. And my daughter said, Dad, we have to be so careful. When we forgive them and they come back into, our, into relationship, what might, we've already been through more than we could cope. So anyway, their eldest one that they had adopted came back to them. Called them up and said, Mommy and Daddy, will you please forgive me? And then I think they felt, if Mum and Dad can do it, so can we. We were in the Sunday service. These two, a, a sister who's now got married, a black girl who married a man, got a little baby, another black man from Africa, married a little baby, and um, they have a little baby, rather, to their marriage. And they, they'd come to stay for the weekend, for the first time in back in the family again, as it were. Not to live in the home, but to come and visit. And they came along to our church on Sunday morning. All right, and the brother, also a brother, that had gone, also done the same thing. Their own brother, in the flesh. So, here they are sitting in. And they got up in front of the church, and they said, we are so sorry. Will you forgive us for our behavior? And it was so beautiful. And the church responded. It was beautiful. Now, Mercy, our adopted daughter, the youngest one from Africa, Liberia, she, um, she had been exercising you know, on these uh, machines, and she had these weights, 10 pound weights, she's holding up and doing this sort of thing, I don't know, doing all these exercises, I don't know what they do. But anyway, she was, she was there. One of the little grandchildren came, picked up that weight, was standing a 10 pound weight, and dropped it on her foot. Right, so she's in church, sitting back with a big foot up there, covered in ice, trying to, with the pain. You know, she's sitting there and she's trying to listen, she's hopped, she, she can hardly move. And uh, I just thought, and I said, look, folks, in this, in this beautiful atmosphere of forgiveness, these folks have shared their sorrow. They've shared their repentance. I feel the presence of God. Let's pray for Mercy's foot. So we all got around Mercy, and Mercy's one of these kind of individuals that doesn't like a lot of attention. She likes press to be short. She likes, she doesn't want everybody taking too much on. So all the grandchildren, 20 plus or whatever we had there that morning, all came gathered around. They're all trying to get their, hand, their hands on her to pray for her. And I said, look, just be careful. Don't just put your hands on that foot. It's very sore, right? You know, it's sore. I said, we're going to make this prayer real quick. And I couldn't, I didn't want them to all be praying. I just said, because I know it embarrassed her. And I said, I think the Lord loves what's happening here this morning. I just said, foot. Everybody say foot. Everybody said, foot. And I said, be healed. And everybody said, be healed. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
healed instantly. Instantly. She got up. She had no pain. Completely healed. Because of unity. Because of oneness. You want prayers to be answered in your life? Be united with your wife. Be united with your family. And God will answer your prayers. Yes, he will. And you can change the world from your home. I like Psalm 2. It says, I've sat my king upon my throne in Zion. The heathen raged and the kings of the earth. They said, let's cast off the restraints of all these Christians. We're humanists. We're liberalists. We don't want them <coughs> trying to stop us from having unrestrained evil and doing what we want to do. We'll, we'll break their cords asunder. We will cast them aside. And he that sits in the heavens shall laugh and have them in derision. He said, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill, Zion, and this day I will declare the decree, the decree, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. He's talking about Jesus reigning and ruling. And then he said to Jesus, his son, ask of me. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen the nations for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Do you think that Jesus ever asked the Father for, for Wales? Do you think he asked the Father for England? Or any of these countries you come from? Of course he did. But the interesting thing is this, that if Jesus the head, remember, he's the head of the church, which is his body, if Jesus, the head, is asking for the nations of the world, then the body is involved. He's using you and your wife and your family in unity and in love to ask him for the nations of the world. We're involved in the intercessions of the head, Christ, with your wife. So you don't need a wife that's lacking... Understanding and lacking in some of these areas that we've been talking about. So that your prayers will not be hindered and your children as you sit around the table and ask. We go through the different nations of the world. We have this, one, this book of 100 gateway cities. Well, anyway, let's carry on. We have five minutes. I want you to understand that you and your family are powerful to change the world. Without your family with you in spirit, you will not be really fruitful. But you and your family. Not you without your family. You and your family. God loves families. He deals in families. Families make up the church. Families make up the nation. You and your family. All right. Stand by your wife and support her with the children with uh, hard times by deliberately being, when the children are deliberately res being respectful, don't side with your children. I, I had a man who came to our retreats every year and he was so disrespectful to his wife in front of the children. He, the children were disrespectful to her and he would side with the children. It was awful. I wondered how that marriage would ever get together. But finally, after being there, going back to that retreat about 10 years in a row, I see a change happening. <laughs> the guy was thick. And anyway, however bad moods, however bad moods, insolence, disrespect, and rebellion towards their mother, who is trying hard to do what is right for the children, must be dealt with by the father when he gets home. He should, be a, he should give appro appropriate discipline, followed by loving words. Everybody say, followed by loving words of encouragement to do better. Praying with the child too. A <coughs> child should be made to sincerely apologize to whom apology is due. A father, a father neglects to, if a father neglects to stand by his wife and support her efforts to teach and train his children, she'll become discouraged and feel inadequate to fulfill her great and important work. A homekeeping mother who is sacrificing her life for the sake of God and her family needs the full weight of her husband's support. Otherwise, she will feel a victim and in a sense, abused and alone. 
You don't want your wife to feel alone. She hasn't got people that she can talk to that understand motherhood, that understand the importance of home. She hasn't got even hardly anybody in the church that, that are doing this. They're all out in the corporate world. She can't even talk to the pastor because he has no idea what she's going through. There's only one person she can talk to, and that's you. That's you. Let yourself be a willing listener because you don't want your wife to be a lonely woman. Why should she be lonely? Because she hasn't got a mother that she can even talk to sometimes, that has a feeling towards family and a feeling towards home to answer these questions that she has. She has not even members of her own family that are all out there with the, with the mindset of the secular world. But she has you. Be a good listener. Be a helpmate to her. Be a blessing to her. She's a helpmate to you. Let's all stand.